Allora, buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti a questo incontro. Good morning everyone and welcome, welcome to this uh, uh, meeting, Freedom in the Open Space. Well, this is a title that is close to that of uh, the meeting, uh, of the sphere meeting, because uh, if the forces that move history are the same that make men happy, this is in itself uh, including the issue of the relationship between the individual and the community and the freedom of the and of the individual and the common space the space of the community so this is why we deal with this topic today so well the title of the 2018 meeting was pronounced by Father Giussani in 1968, a moment that was particularly difficult because there was uh, some kind of tension between the self and the society, a society that needed to change. And uh, so that's the open space. And uh, well, the tension was very, very strong back then. And it gave rise to uh, events whose repercussions are still felt today. Those of you who visited the exhibition in 1968 this must have noticed that this tension is a, a fil rouge. And it is also a very topical theme. We have a, a series of uh, meetings on uh, the meaning of being Italian. And uh, so this is another uh, thread we are following. Uh, but uh, uh, there are so many events. Uh, those of you who were lucky enough to take uh, part to the um, move court space on uh, religious freedom, well, uh, they have uh, seen what I'm talking about. And two of the protagonists of this event yesterday are here with us today. So we have uh, Sabino Cassese, Professor Cassese. Emeritus Judge of the Constitutional uh, Court. He has, uh, is an editor of uh, the Italian newspaper Corriere della Sera, and he is a friend of the meeting. This is uh, not his first visit to the meeting in Rimini. And then another friend of the meeting is uh, Joseph Weiler. di cui forse posso permettermi di, eh, come dire, di, di non presentarlo perché ormai è veramente di casa abbiamo fatto i conti so he is really at home here actually it is uh, the, it, today this is his 30th uh, uh, participation in one of uh, the events of the meeting and then he is going to have his uh, 31st in the afternoon on the life of Moses and uh, Then we have uh, Mr. Barbano, a journalist, a writer, an essayist. And he just wrote a book entitled Too Many Rights, Italy Betrayed by Freedom. And uh, we will talk about this uh, topic specifically. But uh, I would like to start by asking Professor Cassese to introduce this uh, topic of the a relationship between freedom and the open space. You have the word. One day in 1969, in the Catholic University, where the revolution was spreading quickly, Father Giussani heard a boy from Varese saying, if we do not find the forces that make history, we are lost. Well, then Father Dusani then had the idea of this slogan that now gives the title to this year's meeting. I don't think Father Dusani knew that 200 years before, 
a French, uh, a, a French uh, um, writer said that uh, the by. Uh, by trying to build on a virtue, we contribute to the happiness of other people. So how does the topic we want to discuss today, freedom in the open space, fit or it can be adapted to the title of uh, this year's meeting? So I would like to share with you some thoughts on the connection between these two elements. Well, freedom has two different dimensions, a negative dimension and a positive dimension. Freedom in its negative dimension is the opportunity of men and women to make choices without any interferences. And here we talk about the rights of freedom. Then there is a positive version, so to speak, of freedom, which is the opportunity that everyone should have to make choices in order to build an open space, a common space. And this is one of the duties of a free man. What is most interesting is that uh, the modern thought was fascinated mainly by the first version of freedom, the negative one, rather than by the second one. So I would like to, to explain both and, uh, how, and to show you how they are interconnected. The first profile is maybe more difficult for us to understand because we live in a uh, context of freedom. So we feel like, well, we, it is just like uh, the feeling we have for the air we breathe. We realize it, it is there only when it is no longer there. So the same applies to freedom. So in order to understand what this negative aversion of freedom is, I will talk about two episodes of the past. One is in the remote past, 1769, Cesare Beccaria, the greatest enlighter in Italy, uh, who was admired by uh, the uh, Russian Tsar in Catherine. He wrote Dei Delitti e delle Pene, a very famous book, but he could not publish it in the state of Milan, where he, he lived, that was before the unification of Italy, because he was not allowed to do so. He could publish it anonymously in another city, that is to say, in Livorno. Another episode is told by a great art historian from Germany who was in Italy in the 1930s. He went to visit Benedetto Croce, who was at the time the greatest Italian philosopher. It was 1932. And uh, Benedetto Croce said that he wanted to celebrate the anniversary, anniversary of the death of Goethe. But Croce said, I cannot do it publicly. So, I invited a group of friends here in my home and I held a conference, a lecture on Goethe. So these two examples show two cases in which there was no freedom of press or freedom of speech. They were not allowed by the authorities at the time in a so to speak, vertical relationship from the government, the state, to the citizen. So what I said, that is to say that freedom today is for us like the air we breathe. We do not realize how important it is. Well, this does not mean that the history of freedom is over, has come to an end, because there are also future freedoms 
we are used to have freedom in a certain territory. There is the, the freedom of the Italians, the free freedom of the French, but apparently free Italians should not care about the freedom of uh, people living in uh, Somal Somalia and Libya and so on, because well, we have uh, to worry about the new uh, dangers for the freedoms of the past. Uh, there are uh, some decision makers in Hungary, in Turkey, in Poland, and some of them are actually uh, praised by some uh, Italian uh, politicians who say they have uh, created the illiberal uh, democracies, that is to say democracies that are not built on freedom. So we have, in a way, the salvation of uh, the uh, common heritage uh, of the European Union in terms of freedom. So this is the first, so to speak, dimension, the first meaning of freedom in the public space. There is a second meaning, which has nothing to do with this vertical relationship between the state and the citizen, the state limiting the freedom of the citizens. It concerns the relation between free men with reference to the open space, which is a common space, which is a collective space, and which includes a completely different angle, which is not the angle of, of, of right, but rather that of duties. And it is summarized in a way in a um, sentence by an epitaph in the Thermopolis, and it says, I quote, you stranger announce the Spartans that here we lie to pay homage, to pay tribute to our given word. And uh, Nelson in front of Trafalgar in uh, 1805, did not uh, encourage the sailors uh, to uh, behave like heroes. Uh, it simply said that each English sailor had to uh, abide by his uh, duty. So the word responsibility is mentioned nine times, and the word uh, duty or obligation is mentioned seven times. We uh, have a right to vote, but voting is also a, a civil obligation. We have a right to work, but we also have the duty to carry out a task of, or to exercise a profession that can contribute to the development of society. Parents need to take care of their children. The Constitution says that this is both uh, a duty and a, a right. Thus, it uh, actually turns the relationship between rights and duty upside down in terms of with uh, the Constitution of uh, uh, 1795. Uh, uh, an Italian legal expert recently uh, talked about an episode that concerns a philosopher, an Italian philosopher, Bobbio, who said, and when he was no longer young, he would interrupt those who came to him to speak about his famous book, L'Etat dei Diritti. Bobbio died when he was 90. And he said, if I still had the time now, I would rather write a book entitled the L'età dei doveri, that is to say, the age of the duties. So we have talked about uh, rights for many years. One of my fellow panelists, Babano, wrote a book entitled Too Many Rights, and we will hear from him what uh, we can find in this book. But as I said before, we all have the right to vote, but voting is a civil uh, duty. 30% of Italians who have the right to vote do not vote. So they have a right, but they forget that this right is also an obligation towards the state, but also towards their fellow citizens, because they need to participate in 
choosing the uh, members of parliament. So this is the reason why all great historians uh, who dealt with this topic, uh, which we find in uh, um, the words of uh, Father Giussani, that is to say the topic of happiness, well, they said that happiness depends on the quality of our social life, that is to say how we relate to others. So the forces that move history are the same that make men happy. This is, in a way, easier to understand from this point of view. Thank you. I have a question to Mr. Barbano. I would like to ask him to go more into the details of this topic, and I would like him to address another field. Uh, apparently, the open space uh, is opening up to other issues, to issues that we are not so uh, felt so widespread some years ago, for example, issues related to technologies uh, technologies and the digital space. So you're dealing uh, with rights. Uh, can you please uh, talk a little bit about the challenges we are about to face about this relationship between the self and the, uh, and the public space, the open space, vis-a-vis -vis the new developments, uh, the current new developments? Well, the digital space uh, plays a central role for the development of democracies. I believe that the impact that digital communication has had on democracies is one of the problems which, is, uh, which has now become very visible for everybody. I use the word democracy because the, the, it's a physical space in which we can exercise this uh, um, uh, democracy, both passive and active. And today, the exercise of democratic rights and duties is, goes hand in hand with the crisis of freedom and also with the role uh, played by communications and technologies. The internet has become uh, um, something normal, habitual for everybody. That was not the case in 1995. Over the last 20 years, the use of the internet has been promoted, probably in an, a critical and optimistic way in the first uh, 15 years, uh, probably thinking that the internet, uh, believing that the internet would have brought citizens closer uh, to decision makers, uh, that it would have helped reduce uh, the physical space because uh, there is the possibility through the digital space to get information, that it would have uh, enhanced uh, democracy and made democracy more horizontal, more uh, based on participation. And today, we have come to discover that there are a lot of advantages that's undeniable brought about by the internet. We cannot think, uh, we cannot speak of uh, technologies simply by uh, thinking that there's something bad. We cannot think about rewinding history. But today we know that because of the crisis uh, of democracies, uh, we know that there is some kind of an obscure side of uh, uh, the communication made through the Internet. We know that contents are stolen in the Internet, that copyright is violated, that job, the jobs are made more precarious. We know that the privacy of individuals is violated, can be violated sometimes with uh, wounds that will never be overcome when it comes to the protection of uh, the rights of freedom. We know that uh, in the public space, sometimes vulgar communication is used. And so you have this internet public opinion, which is uh, uh, using trash communication, uh, which um, 
is characterized more on election, on, on emotions than on evidence. We know that sometimes this can lead to um, altering the results of elections. And this has become evident, for example, from the past uh, electoral campaigns in the United States, in Russia, also in Italy, as well as uh, in other democracies which are not under uh, the uh, spotlight uh, of Western democracies. For example, I'm talking about uh, uh, Asian democracies in which the manipulation of internet content plays a decisive role for the outcome of political uh, events. So this is the price of the internet, the price of freedom that we had not taken into account. The first question we should pose ourselves uh, is the following. If all of these were inevitable, in other words, if the obscure side of technologies is bound to in a way, uh, condition to influence the development of democracies uh, to such a large extent that, that today lots of young people believe that democracies are not the best way of governing a country. Well, if this is the case, uh, well, isn't this obscure, is this obscure side of technology something that can be avoided or is it inevitable? Put it simpler, in journalistic terms, uh, we might tend to uh, we might uh, compare this to the thought of uh, um, a modern philosopher, uh, Emanuele Severino, who states that technology is a stepchild of uh, culture. Culture uses technology for its aims, but then at a given uh, point, uh, uh, actually, the child kills the parent by actually imposing its own aims to the aims on top of the aims of culture. And so Severino wonders what the aims of technology are. Actually, technology has no aims. It has just one aim, which is that of reproducing itself endlessly by imposing the quantitative dimension of uh, internet clicks to the qualitative dimension of democracies, which select and discriminate based on uh, their own values and this in qualitative terms. According to Severino, this is something uh, which uh, will be there to stay because technology is strong and it is bound, its strength is bound to overcome the strength of uh, culture. And then there's another uh, pattern that might be useful. That's uh, the thinking pattern of a um, contemporary thinker. That is Professor Magatti. He is the dean. He was the dean of the School of Sociology at Catholic University in Milan. Uh, and he wrote a book a couple of years ago called Libertà Immaginaria. This book is about 1968 to a certain extent. In other words, it tells what happened in Western European uh, uh, societies uh, between the post-World War period and modernity. I am simplifying the content of this book. And for the <coughs> simplification, I would like to apologize with the author. But Magatti basically says that after the Second World War and after the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, capitalism needs ordered societies to start producing wealth again. And Republican institutions, so the younger a democracy is at the service of this prospect and therefore builds societies in which institutions and the common uh, ethical values are, uh, are uh, set up and then redistributes the wealth produced by capitalism through the welfare system. This is a pattern that this is a model that worked up to 1968. And then at the given stage, at the given moment, this model started, uh, stopped working, basically, because capitalism noticed that in order 
for it to produce more wealth, it no longer needed ordered societies, but rather disordered societies. And that is because a bigger market, a hyper market, uh, the supermarket actually makes more profit than uh, small retail stores. And so basically, uh, and based on these ideas on uh, by Magatti, uh, there was this invention of divorce. Uh, this is a conquer of the Western society. This is a right of the Western society. And yet divorce as well has a price to pay. And if divorce is not linked with social responsibility, well, then it becomes clear that divorce can bring about social disruption. If it is, if it coincides with a hedonistic view of relationships, if it is viewed as a possibility of the human, of human beings, and not as a remedy of a crisis occurring to uh, a family, well, then uh, divorce brings about a turning point, a, f a fracture, a break in society. I mean, by saying this, I mean that any expansion of our rights has a price to pay. The rights have, uh, in a way, fueled the way in which uh, democracies have set uh, themselves on the world over the last 200 centuries uh, by defying the ancien regime, uh, the absolute monarchies in which uh, there were no citizens but only subjects, uh, only people who were subdued to the authorities. And then when democracies uh, took over, as there was no authority to defy, as there was no uh, possibility to balance these rights uh, with the duties that Professor Garcesi mentioned before. Actually, these democracies have become an element of disgregation. The biggest uh, forms of unhappiness in the past uh, stemmed from lack of rights. And today, the biggest forms of unhappiness uh, stem from an excess, a surplus of rights, which is in a way enhanced uh, uh, by technologies, by expanding uh, the, uh, so to say the sphere of what is possible. Everything is made possible. And the right, uh, uh, in a way, and right actually legitimate uh, these things that are possible simply because they are possible. They become, things become right simply because they are possible. This might explain a series of processes which uh, have taken place in the Western world. Magatti actually uh, talks about the fact that capitalism is faced with the possibility of producing rights. And because of that, it then strikes a balance uh, with movements which were against uh, capitalism which in a way aimed uh, at enhancing the individual and enhancing the individual uh, individualistic aspect of society. This combination, this link between capitalism and the movements that uh, were created in 1968. So we now uh, the result of that is the liquid society that we're dealing with. And this, if this model is, um, in a way, transferred, applied to communication models, we can then realize that we made mistakes, that we really committed mistakes in assessing the potential of risk associated with the expansion of rights uh, for democracy. In 1992, Sorry, the speaker says, uh, in 1992, the Maastricht Treaty was signed, and then in 1989, uh, the Berlin Wall fell. After these two major events, uh, financial central points and technocratic uh, centers uh, uh, were became evident. 
And this, in a way, had the dimension of the nation state enter a serious crisis. When this happened, people realized that as the central government lacked for these systems, well, the basis of national democracies would have been undermined. And this is exactly what happened. If you try and analyze the financial crisis that characterized the first decade of the 21st century, and also the impact that technologies had in, in a way, conditioning the destiny of communications, uh, of technologies and communications. The very same crisis of Europe can be understood from this point of view. Europe found, has found it difficult to basically go from the national dimension to the supranational dimension. If this is true, well, then the solution does not lie in rewinding history and in thinking that it is simply possible to raise walls or levy duties or create uh, um, sovereign niches, uh, protectionist niches in which you can protect yourselves uh, uh, because you are fearful. This is no remedy. This uh, will bring you back to a prospect that is even worse than the limitations you have. I believe that we have to rather try and solve the errors, the mistakes that we have produced. And when it comes to the governance of uh, internet communication, I think there are a number of uh, roads, uh, a number of ways that we can pursue. The internet uh, works in different ways. In China, for, for example, it is uh, pervasively controlled by the state. So it is uh, subject to the control of the state. In Europe, it works the other way around. So basically, it uh, sort of exercises a form of hegemony, and it is able to condition the very same life of uh, democracies. There are no fiscal controls. There are no employment rules that can guarantee the quality and the dignity of workers. There is no copyright. There is no protection of privacy. There is no accountability <coughs> on the part of the providers. So clearly, all of this inevitably leads to the chaos that has become so visible, especially on the occasion of the latest elections that took place in the West. Or the internet uh, is the internet that can be seen in Asia, in some Asian democracies, where depending on whether the fake news are spread by uh, administrators or by the opposition, well, then the destiny of power changes. So clearly, we need to, we need to have governments aware of the opportunities that technology has guaranteed to modernity uh, but we should at the same time uh, prevent any form of freedom, of oppression of the freedom. And at the same time, the people, the subjects who take on the responsibility of governing the network uh, should undergo limitations and should have responsibilities so that they can ultimately protect the freedom of, all, of everybody. And I would like to stop here because we might talk later about the remedies of this. I just wanted to ask Joseph Weiler whether he agrees on this analysis, that is to say that the common space is turning into a jungle because of the new technologies. And uh, how can we face this dynamic? Well, I agree with uh, Sabino and uh, his analysis of a positive, negative freedom, uh, active and passive freedom. Uh, 
because if we just have a, a negative or a, a, a passive freedom, then there is a, something missing. And I am uh, I agree with Barbano because uh, there is a dark side of the net. But I disagree on something. I think that uh, there is a very a feeble connection. Thank you. A weak connection between uh, freedom in the public space and happiness. I believe we can find thousands of examples of people who lived or are living in totalitarian regimes that did not uh, provide any freedom in the open space, but are nevertheless free inside. In our society, that actually guarantees freedom in the open space, we have a lot of people who are not free inside. What do I mean by free inside? Well, even if we have freedom in the open space, I can be a slave to my passions, to my ambitions, to my career, to my ego, to my fame. No one limits my freedom in the open space, but I'm not a free man. Let's take the example of the internet. It is true, there is this technology, but this dark side is uh, due to the fact that we are slaves to Facebook and Twitter. This is how modern men look. We can uh, avoid to have uh, this uh, dark side if we aren't slave to Twitter and Facebook and uh, the, all the social media. And this is a personal choice. We cannot blame technology for this. It is a decision that each of us can make. At the end of the day, if I am not free, if I am obsessed by Facebook and Twitter, well, this is what generates the dark side of the internet. So the first consideration is that freedom comes from uh, our interior freedom. We have to be free towards ourselves and only once we have that, we can have a connection between freedom um, and happiness. Obviously, it is uh, very important uh, that uh, there is a freedom in the open space uh, at the moment, but this does not give us any guarantee of freedom of happiness. Then there is a, a second consideration. Here, I do not really agree with my fellow speakers, that is to say that we keep uh, insisting on the rights. All the, um, well, we have been talking about uh, rights, how to uh, avoid to have too many rights, uh, and uh, but we do not count, uh, talk about accountability, personal responsibility, because uh, the right is uh, the right of a person to do what they want. But there is also a, a form of uh, um, personal freedom, and there is an imbalance in favor of the rights rather than of the duties and of the responsibility of the individual. So, well, once again, if we take into consideration the dark side of the Internet, this dark side is that those who participate in this new public space do what they, what they want, say what they want. They can lie. They can criticize. They can blame others. And this a, a solution cannot be uh, provided by the government, by the state. There has to be something that comes from the individuals. 
their sense of decency towards the others and towards themselves. Then there is a third consideration. When we talk about freedoms, the traditional pattern is that there is the that is the public power, and then there is the individual freedom. In the latter uh, 10 to 15 years, the problem of freedom in the uh, public space is not does not depend between uh, from the relationship between the government and the citizens, but rather from the relationship between citizens. And this makes the situation more difficult because uh, we have a philosophical theories that teach us how to balance public interest uh, and uh, the interests of the individuals. But it is uh, way more difficult to reconcile individual freedom, uh, freedoms. If uh, my uh, freedom uh, goes against the uh, freedoms of someone else, uh, as we said, as we uh, saw yesterday during our fake trial. Thank you. Well, these considerations uh, by Professor Weiler take us uh, to uh, a very um, concrete Territory. So I would like to ask Professor Cassese, whereas he is, he agrees with all the, on this, and if, if we can find an answer to um, Professor Weiler's question, that is to say, how can we help the individuals to to recover the need to have a real relationship with other human beings? Well, I believe. Uh, that there are two different uh, angles in what Joseph Weiler just said. The first element, the first angle, is that if we go on seeing freedom from a negative uh, perspective, this implies that uh, uh, we uh, do not do what we could do. But if we look at freedom from the positive side, this means that there, is, uh, that there are some obligations on the part of the other. Let's think about one freedom, freedom from need. The history of the world in the last century was dominated by the need to free people from their basic needs, the, the, or rather to um, satisfy the basic needs of people. That was a great dream of beverage. That is to say, to guarantee health, education, work, and social protection. Now, in order to do this, we, on the other hand, have to provide a national health service, a national education service open to everybody. We have to uh, guarantee employment. Let's think about uh, the situation, uh, the unemployment situation in Italy and uh, the subsidies, uh, the unemployment subsidies in Italy and also uh, uh, social protection. How can we do this? We have to uh, match these rights with the uh, uh, obligations for everyone to pay for these activities. I mentioned these four areas because if we look at the uh, balance of the Italian state, you will realize that 70% of the expenses are devoted to these four areas of expenses. That is, to say, that is to say that behind these rights, there are the there are some obligations, obligations to contribute to uh, pay for uh, the uh, services that can guarantee these uh, rights. So it's the fiscal obligation, the, the, the duty of the citizen to pay uh, his taxes or her taxes uh, 
so uh, it's a duty towards other citizens. So it is here that I see the balance between uh, the two elements uh, that were uh, quoted by Professor Weiler. That is to say, there are some individuals that uh, cannot only limit themselves to a dialogue with the state and uh, to, to be freed from censorship, for instance, or uh, to be freed uh, and to speak in public. These individuals should ask their state to create the conditions so that other people can give me this freedom from need. So this makes the situation more complicated because it is multifaceted. Um, well, there is a first element, which is that of freedom towards the state, towards other individuals, and through the state towards other individuals. Well, um, we're talking about this awareness of uh, duties. Now, uh, there is too much awareness towards rights, and we need to recover the awareness towards uh, duties, obligations. Uh, what can we do to become aware of our uh, duties as well? Mr. Barbano. Well, actually, civil cultures, uh, Professor Vaila is right. It is the, in the individual dimension that uh, we have this relationship between the object and the subject, between the aim and the means. But this interplay is based on the culture in which the challenge has to be faced. It is the civil thought, it is the political thought that in a way changes the attitude as well as the use that men make of their smartphones. So clearly, we're talking about two different levels, uh, the individual subjective level of uh, uh, the individual subjective relationship with the technology and this civil one, which are in, uh, sometimes in, in opposition but they are related. I would like to give you a couple of uh, examples uh, that relate to what I said before. If Ireland is, so to say, uh, warned by Europe uh, to collect its taxes from Apple, and if Ireland refuses to do that, uh, and actually says, no, I don't want to collect any ta taxes because uh, um, actually I want to become some kind of a tax haven in order to keep Apple on my uh, territory. If this is true, well, then that means that uh, the aim uh, prevails over the means. I would like to add a second example. I would like to talk about the destiny of a young uh, uh, woman from the, the Campania region who spread some personal uh, pictures of hers to just six friends. And these six friends became uh, uh, more than six million friends. And when she tried to stop this, unfortunately, she faced the difficulty of having to, in a way, sue Facebook in Palo Alto because the court of competence uh, in these cases was Palo Alto in the United States. And the American Supreme Court recently decided that in the relationship between citizens and Facebook is no longer the legal headquarters, the, 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 the court of the legal headquarters of Facebook, but rather the place in which the victim uh, is offended. Unfortunately, this is something that is no longer being applied in Europe. So all individual controversies between private individuals and big internet multinationals 
play on a global player and citizens are incapable of uh, reaching that level. Third example, when it comes to um, rules in the working environment, in the internet, uh, we have people who spend six, seven or eight hours uh, and they make actions uh, which, uh, s which emulate uh, work, but they do not have the dignity of work. Uh, these actions, these horizontal actions, uh, however, justify the only vertical profit which uh, is in the hands of uh, uh, monopoly holders. In Europe, uh, we were discussing about uh, the need to raise uh, walls uh, to stop uh, boats uh, in the Mediterranean. And while this was taking place, the European Parliament actually approved a uh, directive to, in a way, pay the copyright. And actually, the news uh, that was transferred was that that law was some kind of a limitation to uh, the freedom of speech, to, the, to copyright. But in fact, that was not the case, because that norm was fundamental to guarantee the protection of uh, uh, journalists' uh, work and of the freedom of expression. It was told the other way around. Unfortunately, the public opinion uh, did, was not interested in that. So that uh, was not approved because of the pressure of uh, internet companies on the politicians of the European Parliament, uh, where at the moment populist forces are uh, have a minority position. If you were to vote on the same directive after the 2019 elections, uh, uh, if populism uh, uh, rises, uh, you, we might have a different solution. So this is a central issue that pertains uh, uh, liberty in the public space and in democracy. But uh, citizens must understand that the protection of public opinion is a heritage that is well linked to the destiny of democracies. One last thing, uh, the providers also have a great responsibility to place. For six years, uh, I was uh, um, the I was leading a newspaper, and I had the deontological, the legal, and the civil responsibility for that. Providers, internet providers, uh, are not uh, accountable for anything. So everything that is published on the internet is, uh, I mean, for that, you don't have any accountability on the part of providers. So it is clear that the challenge here is an individual challenge, as Professor Weiler said, but the individual uh, dimension is strongly influenced by the fact that there is a strong deregulation and that deregulation stems from the lack of awareness that the impact of technologies and the expansion of rights related to that use, I mean rights that are not regulated, uh, is affecting uh, democracy. I believe that this is a central issue to the destiny of democracies over the next few years. I would like to ask Professor Weiler. Uh, we've understood that rules are necessary. However, in order to help develop the uh, interior uh, freedom uh, that you were talking about, are rules enough for that, or should we add something more? Well, if you allow me, I would like to uh, comment on what Sabino Cassese said. I was skeptical about the relationship between freedom and happiness. You mentioned these aspects. You mentioned public education. You mentioned health, a number of aspects. If you take the Nordic countries, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, or Norway, I think that everybody will agree with me on the fact that these countries are more developed than Italy on these aspects. And yet, Italians are happier. <laughs> totally. 
This is uh, just the remark of uh, uh, a Jewish person like me uh, who's lived in many different countries. Happiness is important. If you don't have happiness, I mean, uh, even if these aspects are not present, uh, it, well, then it is difficult that a person is happy. But even when they are there, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are happy. And this one aspect, uh, I um, would like to repeat once again the fact that there is a very delicate issue. Um, I mean, this uh, difficult relationship between uh, public freedom and individual internal freedom. We should not only think about actually uh, think about our freedom and our duty towards the others, but also our duty towards ourselves. I mean, what we do, uh, is it harmful for the others? But we should also consider if it is harmful <coughs> for ourselves as well. So this is what we mean by interior uh, uh, freedom. We may have lots of freedom in the public space that can be improved. But that doesn't tell you if a person is happy or not. If you sit 10 hours in front of the internet, is that person free? I mean, I think that person is a, a slave to an obsession. And maybe you may have differences between us. Uh, you believe that uh, the provider is uh, to blame, the public authority is to blame because they do not, uh, they have not regulated enough. Uh, that's true, but only up to a certain extent. Uh, but I think that we also uh, are to blame for that. Uh, we have the responsibility, each and any one of us is to blame. And that has to deal with internal freedom the internal freedom of uh, taking our own responsibility and not always uh, putting the blame onto the others. Professor, at this point, a question. So, Professor Cassese, I have a direct question to you. What elements can help us educate this interior freedom? I would like to remind Professor Weiler that when the American uh, uh, people who drafted the Constitution uh, uh, joined, actually they wanted to ensure uh, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. They were looking for that. So the question is, what happiness were they referring to? Were they referring to the individual freedom that Professor Vaila is uh, talking about, or were they referring to something different, to some sort of a collective happiness, to something that uh, did not concern that generation, but rather uh, the generations uh, that will come after 200 years? In other words, uh, what I mean with this, that uh, Uh, talking about uh, mentioning the, the motto of this year's edition of the meeting, the forces that made, move history are the same that make man happy. You have no indication of a purely, merely individual happiness, but rather also the, uh, a collective happiness that you can participate in. A form of happiness that foresees the participation of not just one generation, but of several generations ahead. And I believe herein lies uh, the, uh, the key to understand the relationship between freedom and happiness. Well, I didn't think to talk about personal freedom only. I just wanted to say that also collective uh, happiness, the happiness, the happiness of a family, a society, a nation, a community, cannot be 
granted by the freedom in the open space. This does not mean that there isn't, an, that there isn't a connection. But uh, we cannot think that an optimal uh, freedom in the open space is a guarantee of collective freedom. Well, I'm, I do not agree with that. And uh, I believe that a society of happy people is a happy society. I don't know. I don't know what happiness is. It is easier for me to say what uh, happiness isn't. It is uh, not the outcome uh, of uh, some uh, organized group of thinkers who limit themselves to what is happening here and now. I believe that freedom, collective freedom, and political and civil freedom should be seen as the indirect interest in the future of, genera of future generations. Uh, so uh, uh, the growth of the community in the future. So Professor Weiler is right when he says that there is no nothing dividing, uh, dividing us. We need to have, a clear, to have clear duties. When you talked about the fact that we should not act in the right way because our freedom goes against the freedom of someone else. We have to act in the right way because our freedom should not uh, go against our interior, internal uh, conscience. This is one, uh, some kind of prin principle that I do agree with. Well, our backgrounds are different, obviously. But we agree on certain points. However, in order to reach this goal in democracy and within a secularized society where behavior is a change also through the political and civil thought, thought has to take up its personal, its responsibility. So these uh, aesthetics of uh, duties, this the fact that a duty is a part of uh, life's mission, is something that the Western thought has completely forgotten. And here again, uh, we have uh, the, the 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 interpretation of uh, happiness uh, described by Bagatti in his beautiful book. Thank you. I think that, uh, well, uh, the complexity of this relationship has clearly emerged, this uh, relationship between happiness happiness, and the open space uh, and uh, what is the community and uh, the self uh, and what they can give each other. So I would like to make a consideration just to close, close this uh, um, uh, Kant's perspective and this uh, Bible's perspective leaves a question open, that is to say, what behind uh, or beyond the rules and beyond the individual conscious, but together with individual conscious, what can help us find happiness? What can help us be happy? And I believe that uh, it is very interesting to uh, uh, tackle this kind of question within a, a reality, a situation uh, like that of the Rimini meeting, which lives and was created as an open space, open to everyone, with a, a single purpose, and that is to say to make everyone free, to help everyone uh, grow in their freedom. Every single person who comes, even for one single event at the uh, in the at the Rimi meeting. So this uh, perspective that was illustrated by our speakers today is extremely fascinating. When you talk about this relationship between God and the community, well, we cannot think that uh, institutions uh, can provide uh, these needs, these basic needs we talked about. Uh, this is a challenge, a challenge for every one of us, a personal challenge. 
for us as individuals and as groups and communities to uh, find a way to live together in this open space, in this common space, with the characteristics that our speakers talked about. I would like to thank them with a round of applause. And uh, well, then I invite you all, in order to help this uh, this species of growth. Uh, well, remember that uh, the Rimini meeting lives because of your contributions. So, so you can uh, donate in, at the Dona Ora stands that are around uh, the exhibition floors. Uh, because this is uh, the only way for the meeting uh, to continue. Thank you very much.